I'd like to call the meeting to order, and our first order of business is to wish Chairman Towns a happy birthday. Okay, on three, let's hear it. One, two, three, happy birthday, Chairman Todds, and welcome. Thank you for sitting in with us. All right, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's hearing examining the application of green building practices in the federal sector. In recent years, there's been a movement towards greening various aspects of the federal government for improving energy efficiency to constructing buildings with environmentally sustainable materials and technology. The subcommittee will receive testimony from the General Services Administration, the Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency, in addition to several witnesses from the private sector. I welcome our list of distinguished panelists and thank them for their participation. Today's hearing will explore how well the key agencies responsible for greening federal buildings are progressing and what additional steps should be taken to assure that the federal government is being proactive in its approach to green building practices. Despite the recent growth in green building construction and retrofitting of existing buildings across the federal government, Congress has been slow to conduct oversight in this area, in part due to the rapid growth in green building projects and also due to the range of agencies involved in the undertaking. Some of the issues I hope our panelists will address today include finding out how successful current federal green building programs have been to date and what tangible outcomes have resulted from the agency's collaborations with various government working groups, such as the Interagency Sustainable Working Group, which is managed by the Department of Energy. I'm particularly interested in hearing from today's witnesses on how the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, or ESA, and Executive Order 13514, among other relative statutes, have set the parameters for green building practices and how effectively agencies are coordinating their efforts across the government to meet the timelines for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and achieve zero net usage in federal buildings by 2030, as directed by Executive Order 13514. Given the ongoing debate about the merits of various green building certification standards and ratings of systems and DOZ pending notice of proposed rulemaking calling for revised performance standards and for a uniform set of green building standards, I'm interested in hearing from the witnesses as to what they might think is the best approach for the government to take in adopting a uniform set of green building certification standards. With the infusion of funds from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, agencies have received additional assistance in meeting the requirements for achieving energy uh, efficiency in increasing the stock of renovated or new green buildings. However, as this source of funding winds down, there's a growing concern that agencies will have difficulty in continuing to achieve their goals by the dates outlined in ESA and related executive orders. I'm therefore interested in hearing how GSA, DOE, and EPA intend to advance their green buildings agenda on an ongoing basis, given their budget projections and the deadlines imposed by Congress and the executive branch. There has been an emphasis on energy 
reduction usage as it pertains to green building projects and the subcommittee would like the panelists' input on how Congress may provide constructive guidelines and assistance in this area. And finally, I'd like to hear more about how the federal government's implementation of green building practices is affecting the growth of green buildings across the country. Again, I want to thank our panelists uh, for joining us today, and I look forward to their testimony. And with that, I would like to call on uh, Mr. Bilberry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you having this hearing. And uh, Madam Chair, I'd just like to start off by um, apologizing to the, uh, to the panel, because before you stands a man who stands as a very strong critic. Uh, very, I'm very cynical about this entire concept. Um, sadly, I'm not so cynic by nature. I'm a very optimistic person. Living proof is I actually thought I could get elected someday. <laughs> uh, but the fact is, after 40 years of involvement in environmental movement, over 34 uh, years involvement in government environmental strategies, um, just history has taught me that government is quick to make promises about the environment um, and not just slow to delivery, but almost lacking in delivery. Um, you know, we promise people that we're going to clean up our gasoline. We put additives in that not only rob our gas mileage, but pollute our air and claim it's good for the environment. We promise to create offsets for the Washington Capitol um, and said we were going to uh, make sure that our, we're not responsible for pollution. And um, while we stay, continue to bro burn dirty coal to power our, our federal operations, uh, we talk about how terrible it is and how we're so far against it, but we subsidize it c consistently. Um, frankly, uh, as I look at this issue, I see that it has been government regulation that stand in front of innovative alternative uh, technologies that could not only save um, energy but save natural resources. And so I, I've got to apologize up front. I'm going to be very critical of saying um, it sounds good in a report. But does it actually work out? I mean, I've actually seen government agencies tell um, individuals who've used appropriate alternative construction techniques, tear it down because it's not because it's bad, but because it's unapproved by the government process yet. Um, sad commentary to the fact that those of us in government are quick to require everyone else or expect everyone else to change the way they do business, the way they live, the way um, they make everyday decisions, but government is so slow to change our regulations, our attitudes, and our procedures to reflect the environmental reality that all of us, all of us, including and especially those of us in government, um, have a responsibility to share. So uh, with that, enjoy the testimony. I look forward to um, uh, getting your little tidbits of wit and wisdom on this, but I am very critical that there's a huge gap, Madam Chair, between the theoretical approach here in Washington of what we think is going to get done and hope to get done and what actually happens in the real world. And I hope by this hearing we can help to try to bridge that gap. And I yield back. <laughs> thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for recognizing uh, my birthday. Thank you. Uh, and let me thank you and uh, Congressman Bill Bray for holding this hearing. Um, over the past several years, Americans have increasingly focused on ways to save energy while also saving money. This focus has given way to the popularity of what many see as part of a solution to America's energy needs, going green. The backbone of going green is saving energy, and saving energy means saving the environment and saving money. Today we are here to talk about going green as it relates to the construction of federal buildings. 
In other words, buildings paid for with taxpayers' dollars. The federal government is the nation's largest energy consumer. Green building practices are essential to achieving the goal of energy conservation. And I fully support green initiatives. Going green is essential not only to the sustainability of our environment, but to the sustainability of our country. However, I do have some questions about the government's progress in implementing green initiatives, like the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Let me conclude by saying I am interested in learning how federal agencies plan to continue greening the government once Recovery Act funds are no longer available. While I am all for the greening of federal buildings, I strongly believe that we need to invest taxpayers' dollars very wisely. We need to make sure money is spent only on green initiatives that are cost effective. And I strongly feel that the government ought to be learning, um, ought to be leading the way to energy independence. But the question is, are we doing it right? That's the question. And I hope you can help us answer that question today. Madam Chair, I yield back and I look forward to the testimony. Okay. Uh, I yield now to Mr. Luke Meyer for opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no statement this time. Okay. I'll now yield to um, Mr. Cuellar for opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman again. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to thank uh, the witnesses to be here uh, that are with us here today. I think what we're looking at, uh, we're certainly looking at some opportunities that I think we're all familiar with the opportunities, what it means to green uh, the buildings. And, and I think the ranking member is right that, you know, if we're going to be asking the private sector to do certain things, we ought to look at our own reflection and see what we're doing with GSA or you know, with the other uh, agencies to make sure that we do the same thing if we're going to be asking uh, the private sector to do that. I think we're familiar with opportunities, uh, what it means to the workplace, and uh, I think our first witness has talked about what's not only a building to look at, but it's a place to work and to, uh, and to spend a lot of time there. But I think what we ought to look at today, and what I'm interested in, Madam Chair, is that uh, we look at uh, what are the performance measures? You know, when we talk about greening, what does that mean? How do we actually I'm not interested in measuring activity. I'm more interested in measuring the results of what we mean by, by greening. Uh, what about the, uh, having the trained federal agency staff to make sure that we oversee uh, those results? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, and if we uh, contract energy saving performance uh, contracts, uh, make sure, making sure that we have that available. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, activities and efforts to comply with the provisions in ISA is important also. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I'm looking at also is to, as we do those performance measures, to make sure that one agency, another agency, the other agencies are using uniform, uh, uniformity in those uh, performance measures. And again, we have to be rather quickly, I mean, very carefully, uh, careful about this, Madam Chair, because I think in the past when we talked about performance measures, agencies with all due respect sometimes, and I think members of Congress do the same thing, is that we measure the activity. You know, uh, you know how many, you know, what are we doing uh, to do this? But I think the results, and that's the definitional uh, challenges that we face is, uh, I think, uh, what we ought to be looking at. So again, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I think we're going to have a great hearing. Thank you to the witnesses. And I will now yield to Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman, and, and thank you so much for holding this hearing which I think is actually very important. While I certainly join with my friend from San Diego in the caveat he laid in front of us, I cannot join with him in his avowed cynicism. Um, I actually think this is an exciting challenge with enormous potential. Uh, and when I was chairman of Fairfax County until I came to this Congress, uh, we were doing similar things, requiring LEED certification of all of our government buildings, uh, a standard uh, reflected certainly in, in um, uh, 
uh, in the commitment uh, embodied in the Energy Independence and Security Act, uh, ISA, and the Executive Order 13514. We spend uh, $24.5 billion a year in energy cost as a federal government for federal facilities. And if we can meet the standards we've set for ourselves of 26 percent energy savings by going to LEED certified buildings, we can save six billion of that cost every year. Six, that is significant. And those are real savings to be had uh, as we move forward. Uh, and so I, I think the potential is enormous. And we just got to, as my friend from Texas just said, we've got to have real metrics and measurable goals and, 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 and milestones along the way to make sure we're, in fact, reaching that savings. But that savings can really help us a lot as we go forward. We've already got 12 LEED-certified uh, LEED buildings. We're committed to carbon-neutral buildings, and we have one now, I guess, in Denver. Uh, obviously, this committee wants to know more about, well, all right, what are the plans to making sure we get to our goals by 2030? Uh, because they're generating 33 percent lower greenhouse gas emissions than normal buildings. Um, I might add that uh, sometimes there are upfront costs in going to LEED certified buildings, but the payoff is considerable. In my county, for example, we, as a matter of measurement, said, okay, it cost a little bit more to initially build a green certified building. But by year 14, we start saving net money and we fully recoup those costs and we start saving money every year thereafter and we as a lifespan put 40 years in a building even though we, we usually get more at the federal government it's much more dramatic we put 100 years on a building so the 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 out years in terms of cost savings are quite considerable uh, the other thing we're committed to is pre-development hydrology standards for stormwater runoff at federal facilities very important for uh, endangered estuaries, very important for fragile ecosystems, certainly here in the National Capital Region, a very important standard uh, as we're trying to restore the Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in the United States. And finally, Madam Chairwoman, uh, I believe low impact development techniques can make a big difference uh, when we're looking at the entirety of a federal facility. It may be you know, pervious pavers, it may be rain gardens on the roof, uh, it may be uh, uh, an alternative to, a, you know, asphalted uh, uh, and impervious surface parking lot. Um, I will say, however, in my view, we should not be building one-for-one -one structured parking spaces on a federal facility next to a transit station. Uh, that defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do here, and it is an unnecessary expense to the taxpayer, and I think we, we have to abandon that practice. But we also, in urban areas, uh, need to use these techniques to lower, if you will, what's known as the heat island effect. Uh, we know that in some urban areas, the temperature variance can be 22 degrees higher Fahrenheit than in the comparable rural areas because of the radiant heat effect on asphalt and buildings and structures. So we, the federal government, need to make sure that we're cognizant of that and addressing that as well. Every one degree increase in Celsius increase, increases ground ozone levels by 5 percent, leading to higher asthma uh, rates and other respiratory ailments. So we have an obligation to be addressing that, too. But finally, Madam Chairwoman, I want to congratulate you for holding this uh, in, in a series of hearings. I think this is a very significant hearing, and I think here is an opportunity for the federal government to strike a blow for the environment, for public health, uh, and to help save significant amounts of taxpayer dollars while we're at it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. If there's no additional uh, statements, uh, the subcommittee will now receive the uh, testimony from our witnesses that are before us today. We'll now to, uh, turn to our first panel. Uh, it's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. And I'd like to ask all of you to please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative, and you may be seated. And I'll now introduce the first panel. And I'd like to start now with Kevin uh, Gamshur, 
and uh, he, who is the director of the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings for the General Services Administ uh, Administration. Mr. Gamshur, are we pronouncing that correctly? Gamshur. Oversees the framework for which GSA responds to the challenges of greenhouse gas emission reductions and of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act's mandate to move GSA's federal building inventory towards high performance green buildings. Kathleen Hogan is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where her portfolio of $900 million annually includes energy efficiency, policy, program, and research. Previous as a uh, division director, Dr. Hogan directed EPA's clean energy programs and focused on removing market barriers for energy efficiency and renewable energy. And Dennis Bushta is the Deputy Assistant Director in the Office of Administration for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Mr. Bushta previously served as EPA's Director of Safety, Health, and Environmental Management Division and as an Acting Director of Facilities Management Services Division. He was Director of Industrial Relations for Newmont Minerals Corporation, and he has worked as an adjunct faculty member at the West Virginia University. And I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you very much for being here this morning. I ask that each one of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and to keep this summary uh, under five minutes, if you can do that. Uh, your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. And uh, Mr. Kamshur, uh, please proceed. Thank you and good morning, Chairman, Chairman Watson, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and members of this subcommittee. Uh, my name is Kevin Kamsher, and I'm the Director of the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings in the U.S. General Services Administration. Thank you for inviting us today to discuss the progress and challenges with green building practices in the federal government, and thank you for including my full written uh, statement into the record. In 2007, under the Energy Independence and Security Act, Congress created the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings to enable and enhance federal leadership in sustainable real property portfolio management and operations. The office now combines deep knowledge of federal processes with multidisciplinary expertise in high performance green buildings, providing leadership both within GSA and the federal government, as well as influence and interaction with the broader commercial property market to ensure that our buildings minimize their burden on both the environment and the taxpayer. A principal duty of the office is to ensure full coordination of high performance green building information and activities within GSA, and this duty expanded with the passage of the uh, Recovery Act. Under the Recovery Act, GSA received $5.55 billion to be reinvested in the federal building's portfolio and to create a few new buildings as well on an accelerated basis. And in fact, GSA to date has done four times as much work in this regard as it ever has done before. And today we stand with contracts in place of $4.4 billion. Uh, GSA has leveraged its specialized expertise in sustainability and procurement practices to support the investment of these funds consistent with the intent of the Recovery Act. In the months immediately following the passage of the Recovery Act, we engaged directly uh, across GSA in the public buildings in particular, uh, service in particular, to provide support to the development of and the plan for executing these projects. We established minimum performance criteria to guide the scoping and execution of projects to transform federal buildings into high performance green buildings that use less energy, have better indoor environmental quality and health and performance conditions, reduce pollution, and produce less waste. 
building tune-up, lighting, HVAC, retrofit and replacement, renewable energy generation, and water conservation projects have all been incorporated into projects based on the limits of funding, the scope of the act, and return on investment analysis uh, for uh, the components of the investment. An example of a project taking full advantage of these greening opportunities is the modernization of the Edith Green Wendell White Federal Building in Portland, Oregon. It will attain LEED Platinum, the highest LEED rating available under the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED rating system. Using advanced design features, including radiant panels, uh, different uh, 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 fenestration on different sides of the building to react differently to the way that the sun rises and sets in that particular climate, uh, the structure will consume 60 percent less energy of a typical office building in that location and will incorporate a uh, facade that um, that is designed specifically for the uh, location within the city. I might also add that the oldest uh, planted roof in GSA's inventory is on the parking garage of that same building. It was planted in 1975 and has never leaked. Another example of the new Department of Homeland Security headquarters that we're building on the St. Elizabeth's campus in Washington, D.C. The initial building, the new Coast Guard headquarters, will have five acres of vegetated roof, narrow floor plates to maximize access to natural light, an innovative uh, uh, heating system that will be uh, using combined heat and power for the facility and provide infrastructure support for the rest of uh, the Department of Homeland Security in that campus, as well as being highly transit accessible. We are leveraging our Recovery Act investments to turn our large, varied, and stable inventory of buildings into a proving ground for green building technologies, materials, and operating regimes in order to become one of the real estate industry's sources for data on the actual performance of systems in use. And we will be measuring that performance over a minimum of three years after complete operation and acceptance. Um, we have worked to support and apply the most effective green building rating systems and standards, drawing on objective analysis performed by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, managed by the Department of Energy. GSI has identified LEED as the most effective rating standard for the federal real property inventory to attain, with a focus on the LEED new construction system and a growing focus on existing buildings. GSA requires that a LEED rating of gold or better be part of the design criteria for all new construction and major renovation projects, and the current agency currently has 48 LEED certified owned and leased buildings with approximately 150 more working towards accreditation at the end of their project uh, period. Eighteen of these projects to date have exceeded the minimum with LEED Gold certifications, and one GSA lease, the FBI Regional Office in Chicago, has achieved the LEED Platinum rating for existing buildings, the first of those ratings ever to be given. Uh, the Energy Star system developed by EPA and the Department of Energy together and managed by them is also used by GSA and other federal agencies. GSA today has over 130 buildings with Energy Star ratings and we are expanding that into the leased inventory as well. We track environmentally preferable purchasing in compliance with federal mandates and there are just want to conclude with a couple of challenges related to measuring green building performance outcomes. A key issue is increasing the number of advanced or smart meters in federal buildings that track energy and water usage, which we are doing in every building that was touched by Recovery Act funds. Um, indoor environmental quality is particularly difficult to track and measure because it involves such a wide variety of pollutants as well as atmospheric conditions, all of which can both interact with each other and impact occupants' health and productivity in many ways. Research to develop user-friendly indoor environmental quality metrics is needed. Um, a, uh, another area that the federal government's ability to invest in projects with greatest environmental benefits would also be advanced is if the authority of agencies to make contracts for renewable energy were extended from the current limit in GSA's authorizing legislation of 10 years to 20 years. Uh, and this would allow a cost-effective uh, creation of markets for uh, renewable energy that is not uh, there. And finally, GSA has a long history of working cooperatively and effectively with federal partners, and I will cover that in the longer uh, uh, testimony that's there. And with that, I think I should stop because I'm over my time. Thank you very much. We will now proceed on to Ms. Hogan. Good morning, Chairman Watson, Ranking Member Bilbray, and members of the subcommittee. 
Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, with you today about the Department of Energy's efforts with federal green buildings. The federal government is becoming a leader in green building practices across its 3.2 billion square feet and its very large annual facility energy bill. And it is raising the bar through Executive Order 13514 that was signed in October 2009. These efforts do make good sense by providing significant savings in taxpayer dollars, significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and of course creating jobs. Today I would like to update the subcommittee on federal facility performance, uh, share how the federal <coughs> agencies do collaborate uh, to make buildings more energy efficient and sustainable, and to discuss some additions to the federal toolkit that could help the government more readily achieve future statutory targets and others recently set by Executive Order 13514. The Department's Federal Energy Management Program, or FEMP, works with agencies to help them improve and to track their performance on key sustainability metrics that have been set forth by statute as well as executive orders. Preliminary data for fiscal year 09 are quite promising uh, and show a number of things. They show a reduction in energy intensity of about 13 percent relative to fiscal year, to fiscal year 2003, surpassing uh, the annual goal that had been set. They, uh, the data also show an increase in renewable energy use, which now meets more than 4 percent of the government's electricity demand, also surpassing the fiscal year 2009 goal. The data show a decrease of more than 4 percent in water intensity uh, relative to 2007, surpassing the fiscal year 2009 goal. And the data show close to full compliance, 99 percent, with metering the electricity use uh, in the buildings where that's appropriate, and show very high compliance with the design of new federal buildings to be substantially more efficient than the typical building built to code. Further, uh, we do expect to have strong results for fiscal year 2010 as investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy at federal agencies did increase 84 percent in fiscal year 2009 over the prior year for really the highest year ever at uh, about $1.7 billion. Now success does take a team effort uh, and the Department of Energy does work closely with GSA, EPA and the other agencies. We are organized through Executive Order 13514 into a set of topical working groups with clear roles and responsibilities. Through these working groups, we can tap the communal knowledge and resources available across the entire federal government, and uh, my written statement provides greater detail on those efforts. So as we look forward, uh, we, and we know we have taken big strides, we also see that we have more room to drive down energy costs in federal facilities and to meet future statutory and executive order requirements. Energy efficiency does remain a top priority. There are literally hundreds of off-the-shelf technologies and products uh, the government can use to save energy, uh, technologies and products that are life cycle cost effective, the placebo effect. As facilities uh, last decades, these energy efficient retrofits can reap rewards for years to come. Cool roofs are another important efficiency measure. Cool roofs reflect the sunlight and reduce heat gain, lower air conditioning bills for direct benefits, as well as improve air quality. Just this week, DOE released guidelines for selecting cool roofs for federal agencies, and the Department Secretary Chu sent a memo to departmental leadership instructing them to use cool roofs when building or replacing existing roofs. The federal government has a number of tools to overcome the higher initial costs of energy efficiency and renewable energy, which do frequently hinder investment. For example, as mentioned, energy saving performance contracts, uh, which can provide investment capital to improve federal facilities. This tool has provided around $2.3 billion in federal facilities investment and helping us save more than 18 trillion BTUs of energy annually, enough energy to power a city slightly larger than Kansas City, Missouri. With a few additional tools, 
we could help deploy energy efficiency and renewable energy at greater scale, which is necessary to meet our future targets. For example, uh, as just mentioned, we cannot currently use power purchase agreements broadly across the federal government, except for the Defense Department and the Western Area Power Administration. The government can only enter 10-year agreements with renewable energy purchasers, producers. Uh, extending that renewable energy power purchase authority to 20 or 25 years for all the agencies, as well as changing the way these projects are scored in the budget process, could significantly increase renewable energy use across the government. We also need to look at ways for federal agencies to reinvest savings to support additional retrofits so we can save even more money rather than reducing the agency operating budgets to match the reduced use of energy and water. And lastly, if the definition of renewable energy were changed to include renewable thermal energy that displaces our need for electricity, the agencies would have a, a much wider set of options for low-cost renewable energy. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to share uh, this update, and uh, we'll be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you. And we thank you. Uh, you may proceed, uh, Mr. Booster. Chairman Watson, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's work, success stories, and challenges associated with green building practices and improving environmental performance in federal facilities. EPA occupies nearly 11 million square feet of office, support, and laboratory space across the country. The agency relies upon the General Services Administration to acquire virtually all of its office and non-laboratory support facilities. The agency is currently meeting or exceeding the green building requirements found in the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 in Executive Order 13514 and considers itself to be a leader in the federal government in the renovation and construction of green buildings in both facilities owned by EPA and those provided through GSA. We have worked very hard to acquire the U.S. Green Building Council's Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design LEED New Construction Certification for buildings we have constructed or are leasing through GSA and private property owners. As of last December, EPA had gold or silver certification for over 186,000 square feet of property that we own and over 1 million square feet of rented property. EPA has reduced energy at its reporting facilities by over 18 percent since 2003. Since September of 2006, the agency has acquired delivered green power and renewable energy certificates equivalent to 100 percent of its conventional electricity use. In addition, the agency has applied a variety of innovative approaches to reduce water use by almost 11 percent since 2007. Both EPA and GSA facilities contain numerous green roofs, large and small pervious pavement parking lots, rain gardens, and systems to harvest and reuse rainwater. EPA also makes extensive use of recycled materials in its construction projects. Energy efficiency is an essential component of green buildings. Several of our offices include EPA's Region 8 building in Denver, Colorado, which has earned the Energy Star rating, further highlighting the significance that EPA and GSA place on achieving top energy performance. The agency currently has systems in place to collect and measure data for energy efficiency, water conservation, construction waste recycling, and scope one and two greenhouse gas facility emissions. And throughout the federal government, agencies are working together to improve systems for collecting information related to employee commuting and waste diversion rates. EPA works within its appropriation to implement the many dimensions of our green building program. We are currently exploring ways to fund upgrading old mechanical systems in 4 million square feet of our laboratories to improve their energy efficiency. The agency is also committed to finding ways to ensure that building operators are available and trained to oversee and maintain increasingly more complex green building equipment. EPA believes that Congress and the executive branch played a significant role in promoting the design and use of green buildings through the passage of the current federal laws and executive orders, which set challenging energy and water reduction goals for federal facilities. These current requirements have and will continue to make 
a meaningful impact in helping EPA and other agencies achieve significant energy reductions and improve their environmental performance. EPA has shared a very positive experience in collaborating on numerous projects with other federal agencies in promoting green facilities. The Interagency Energy Task Force and the Interagency Sustainability Working Group, coordinated by Department of Energy and GSA, have provided a critical service in assembling and sharing information about best practices, and GSA has provided a testing ground for new technologies and design approaches. Several online energy management tracking and assessment tools that EPA developed include Portfolio Manager and Target Finder. An estimated 20% of the commercial building market, representing 15 billion square feet, uses Portfolio Manager to track energy and water usage, assess the performance of buildings, set goals and make reductions across building portfolios. Some of EPA's greatest success in promoting green buildings and technologies can be found in our numerous voluntary partnership and product labeling programs, including Energy Star, Water Sense, and Climate Leaders, just to name several. By following the Energy Star guidelines for energy management, buildings can achieve, on average, a 35% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and realize energy savings. EPA has also issued stormwater guidance to provide information about permeable pavement and roofing options that address environmental issues associated with water runoff. EPA strongly endorses the many benefits associated with green buildings and looks forward to continuing our work with the subcommittee, our partners throughout other federal agencies, and the public to ensure an economically and environmentally healthier country. Thank you again for inviting me to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd first like uh, to make this statement, and I'm sure that all of our members would concur, that we're struck by the fact that the federal government is the nation's uh, largest consumer and greenhouse gas emitter. And uh, I'm particularly struck by the fact that our nation's buildings account for 40 percent of our primary energy use. Obviously, the federal government can and must play a leading role in providing guidance on how the buildings must be constructed in the future uh, to maximize the goals of energy efficiency and environmental sustainability. And I appreciate the testimony. I think that you have addressed uh, a lot of the initial uh, areas of concern that I have. I'll call on other members in just a second. But I'd like to start with Mr. Camshire and say, uh, is the GSA committed to eventually making all of its buildings uh, LEEDS certified? And if so, how uh, long will this take and at what cost to government? Today, we require every major renovation and new construction project and uh, major um, lease construction project to achieve a LEED Gold rating. That's the new buildings. We are yeah, currently- Yeah, so most of it is prospective. Correct. In and the existing buildings is a large component of Executive Order 13514, as well as some previous executive orders. The current goal is to have a minimum of 15% of our inventory uh, certified by 2015. We are actually looking at accelerating that. Uh, we will not have the schedule for acceleration uh, probably for several months yet, uh, but we believe that we can do more in the short run with existing buildings, especially based on the work that we're doing with the Environmental Protection Agency to use uh, Energy Star Portfolio Manager as a screening. So what we will be doing is looking at how many of the buildings today are capable, but we just don't happen to know it, of achieving such a rating. We currently are on track to meet that 15 percent goal. We do not expect that the cost of achieving those ratings will be um, an incremental change to our budget request because we have uh, seen that as we move these buildings to uh, greater energy performance that those kinds of improvements that we make to achieve the ratings actually pay for themselves in relatively short order. 
uh, in yesterday's meeting that was hosted by the White House on uh, related topics of high performance green buildings, uh, Ken Hubbard from the Heinz Corporation stated that his company, when they take over a new building from another owner, can typically reduce the energy consumption by 20 percent solely through the imposition of better management practices and better me measurement metrics combined with their pre-existing uh, high quality um, labor force. So we are hoping to emulate some of those practices in our existing buildings and accelerate that. And I would ask that as we get that uh, plan closer that we could submit it to you. Great. Uh, Ms. Hogan, would you like to come in? Uh, we um, at the Department of Energy are also looking to see what we can do with our uh, existing buildings. Uh, as you just heard, there are important requirements for the new buildings, which uh, we are, of course, uh, on target to meet. So a big, a big part of the question is how you address the existing building stock. Uh, what we are doing, um, somewhat similarly to GSA, is undertaking um, sort of a, sort of an in information collection effort to really better understand uh, the state of these buildings, figure out what we can do, uh, and implementing a number of initiatives to see how we can improve them um, you know, quickly uh, and in a way that uh, will get, we'll get the savings uh, that is there to be gotten, as well as to train the people that are out there that need to be trained to maintain that continued improvement. So really investing in the infrastructure so we can get these low-cost savings. And Mr. Bushra, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you. EPA's uh, uh, real federal property inventory primarily consists of laboratories which tend to be uh, a, a bit more energy intensive, environmentally intensive, and a bit more complex. And because of, of that inventory, uh, we are able to, or we have applied a number of different approaches, uh, first starting with commissioning and recommissioning of, of the mechanical systems, updating technologies, and making some renovations. And on the uh, new construction and major construction, uh, we, we believe we are uh, in line with, uh, with meeting those uh, requirements. In some of our older structures, we are currently working at upgrading those and plan to, uh, to hit those targets uh, in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. And uh, Madam Chair, I know uh, I was pointing out some of the things that we're not doing uh, we talk a lot in what we're not doing. I just like to point out an example that um, today there's 155 applications um, for siting renewable um, energy um, uh, facilities on Bureau of Land Management property in California alone. 155. Been there for years. Not one permit has been issued. Um, it's easier to say no than it is to try to move forward because there's risk. I. I'd like to um, sort of back up and start where it all starts, and that's when the energy enters our federal facilities. Where is the electricity coming from that is lighting these light bulbs? It's coming from the PJM grid with a uh, series of different production uh, facilities uh, contracted for by PEPCO, generally speaking. <laughs> And what is their major energy sources? Uh, PEPCO, I believe, has a portfolio that is uh, predominantly coal-fired plants, but with some uh, renewable energy mixed in there. Uh, we can certainly look up that information as it's recorded in the Energy Information Agency of the Department of Energy. Well, let me just tell you, as a Californian, when I came here, I was appalled to see the coal plants here. Um, in California, you go to prison for burning coal, okay? Um, and for the federal government uh, to be so, re you know, so punitive at those of us in California while we struggle to clean up our environment, then to come here and see what appears to be a total lack of standards um, really concerned me that we ourselves are the federal government. Now, I know one thing about energy, um, the ability to wheel. There, uh, are you... Uh, are you here today saying that this is the cleanest portfolio that we can legally purchase, that we are forced in the capital of the United States to have to buy um, dirty cold energy to generate our, our light bulbs? 
Have you had anybody look at the possibility of wheeling and, and specifically purchasing zero emission electricity? Today, uh, GSA purchases zero emission electricity at about 10 percent of its total electricity electricity purchases across the board, and we have committed to uh, reach 30 percent within uh, by by year 2020. Why 10 percent? Why why don't we tell basically say, look, we're in the market, we'll go buy zero emission electricity and wheel it into the region. Why, why, because we're, are we worried about the price of buying clean energy? Is that the problem? And I only say this because I know in California, and I think that the Madam Chair will know that, consumers have the ability to go shop, purchase clean technology, even if it's paid at a premium, but that's a consumer decision that individuals make. Are, we are not allowed to make that. We can't make that as the federal government sitting in the capital of the United States. I am not aware of any law that would prevent us from making that decision. I am certain that there would be a cost impact of that decision. Well, I wonder if the cost impact is going, you know, um, would be as much as $90,000 or whatever. Frankly, we see the history that we tried to make this effort of playing the offset game and trying to play, you know, do a smoke and mirror game rather than saying specifically um, we want to buy it from these locations, and we will not buy, the federal government will not buy coal um, unless, you know, basically anything that has that emissions, especially when the fact that we have facilities that are zero emission generators. And I like to open that up for a conversation. As if, think about what we're doing here. We ought to do conservation. It's, it's, it's not just environmentally responsible, it's economically responsible. But if you've got the ability to make sure that you have zero greenhouse emissions caused by your electricity use. When do we stand up and say we're willing to do the right thing and set an example for the rest of the country? If, I guess the car argument is how do I face off with the, with the people in Ohio and tell them they have to do without if those of us in Washington, D.C. won't do without? Go for it, EPA. <laughs> I think you're asking some very important questions. Uh, I think uh, what the federal government is doing is getting organized to make important progress uh, in all of the areas that you're mentioning. Uh, and I think what's important when you think about renewable energy, when you think about greenhouse gas emissions, is you put together a strategy from how to get from where you are today to where you need to get Where are tomorrow. we today? What is the total emissions of the electricity that we're using on Capitol Hill today? What is the total emissions of, um, annually of the electricity we're using today on this hill? We can get you the numbers of what the greenhouse gas uh, inventory is for the federal government. That is what the agencies are working to put together as a result of executive order uh, that, that we've been talking about. As part of that executive order, each agency has been asked to put together an aggressive greenhouse gas reduction target and then put together a strategy for how to meet that target. For the Department of Energy, we've put together a goal of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 28 percent by the year 2020. And to do that, we will be uh, investing more in renewable energy, we'll be doing more with energy efficiency, and we'll be uh, addressing our fleet issues. And we'll be doing it across that full portfolio in as cost-effective a means as possible. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I'm just saying that I, I grew up working on pollution problems. And the one thing I realized, it's a lot easier not to dump the sewage into the environment uh, than it is to try to clean it up later. So I'd like us to go be proactive and eliminate the emissions rather than mitigate them. Thank you. I think that you're addressing uh, one of the missions of this subcommittee, and obviously, we're going to be holding more hearings looking at uh, the reports that we get from your various agencies. It's important that we have this discussion, and we definitely will allow time to continue this discussion until we hit on something. I can concur with uh, 
our distinguished ranking member. I also am from California. I worked in Sacramento, and I remember flying down into this gunky kind of airspace. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I remind uh, former Governor Jerry Brown that he talked about the environment before most people could spell it. That was in the 70s. And so we took it on. And now I happily fly into my city of Los Angeles, and I can see the water. <laughs> but I tell you, it was really bad. So we're going to continue. Yeah, for the record, um, yeah. LA Basin has twice as many people and twice as clean air. Yeah. We've worked on it over the years. Uh, I'll now yield to Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate this meeting uh, and the panelists. Um, my, my thoughts and questions are variation of what the ranking member is talking about. I enjoy coming to a meeting in uh, a building that's far from green to talk about these issues and parked in front of this meeting and every meeting, committee meeting we have uh, in this building and the energy committee meets in this building as well are uh, SUVs the size of Detroit. Uh, I don't know why people in this town feel the need that the only way they can get around is in a vehicle that large with a perfectly good subway system. Uh, several of us ride bikes. But I think the point the ranking member was getting to is um, it's up to us. Uh, and I'm there as the sponsor of LEED certified building ordinance, which passed in Cook County, third largest in the country. We actually have new courthouses that are being built that are LEED certified. Um, you know, it's up to us. What we learned there is that we were creating markets. Government's such a large purchaser, not just the federal, but state and local. Uh, we can change things, which gets to the point the ranking member is. We, we have to look beyond what we're trying to do here. Um, and the variation of that that I want you to come on, if you would, is the standards that you're talking about. When we started, we were just happy to pass a bill, and we thought any standards were fine. Uh, now we've heard of concerns, perhaps, beyond that with Energy Star standards as it relates to the consumer level at least, but also occasionally with LEED. Is, you know, who's deciding where we can go as technology changes, uh, as our needs change, as, as the needs change to do this? You know, is LEED where we need to be? Is, are there others that we're looking at? Are we pushing the envelope in other manners? Uh, thank you for that question. The, um, at the moment, I think LEED is the, uh, I know LEED is the best rating system that is in the market in the United States today. We did a study in 2006 with Pacific Northwest National Laboratories to ascertain that. The Energy Independence and Security Act acts, asks us to repeat that study once every five years and we'll be commencing the follow-on study next year. Um, it's not, on the other hand, a standard. The most recent standard, which GSA and the Department of Energy and EPA have all been working on together with a variety of uh, other public, state, um, private entities is the ASHRAE standard 189.1 for sustainable buildings. Uh, it's a comprehensive standard language uh, standard for green buildings and it, for example, um, the law currently requires us to be 30 percent better than the ASHRAE Energy Code, and this particular green building standard achieves that uh, within the code standard language. Um, I would, if I were predicting, I would say that the decision we make five years from now may be different. I would expect the standards to increase. I know that the Energy Code itself in the ASHRAE committee is getting more stringent as technology and adoption of that technology has gotten greater uh, with that throughout the industry, and I would expect the, the subsequent revisions of the Energy Code to become much, much closer to what the government is trying to do today. I would agree with GSA. Uh, however, I think there are a number of folks that feel that uh, uh, while uh, LEED provides a, a good application, there's a considerable there's a considerable uh, variability in, in the LEED in the LEED approach, which uh, as one is uh, one is using the, the point system, that two buildings that may be uh, receive the same LEED rating may have a considerable variability. For example, in energy consumption, so the 
the focus on, on specific uh, applications may not be the same. So there's a considerable interest, and EPA would support that in raising the bar on some of those applications. I think that's going to happen uh, over time. We would agree that LEED is, uh, is a very usable across-the-board application at this time and, and one that we should focus on. And, and I think these are the types of discussions that uh, the agencies do engage in as part of their uh, interagency working groups. Uh, and as a result of some of these discussions, uh, what you'll see reflected in the notice of proposed rulemaking that the Department of Energy has out on sustainability principles is sort of a, a framework for how to approach uh, green rating programs. What you'll see in that uh, notice of proposed rulemaking is that we're not selecting one green building rating system. We're putting forth a set of criteria that we think a green building system ought to meet to be a green building certification system the federal government would use. Uh, so what you want are you know, per performance-based metrics, uh, so that you can sort of measure uh, and, and, it, and strive for high performance. You also want there to be a strong uh, verification system uh, that, so that when you get a certification for the building design, that down the road you go back and check to make sure the building was designed to meet those levels uh, and, and sort of maintains that level of performance. But, so we've, we've taken that path. Uh, that, sustain, that notice of proposed rulemaking is currently out for public comment, and we're holding a public meeting, I believe, next week, uh, and we'll be happy to come back and, and share what the uh, outcome uh, of that process is. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And let me begin, first of all, by saying I uh, concur with uh, my, our friend from San Diego, uh, the ranking member on the need to shift the federal energy supply from coal to renewable sources. That's why I and so many others in this Congress supported the energy legislation we passed in the House last year, which creates alternative and new and renewable energy markets. Uh, frankly, without that kind of legislative framework, we'll be stuck where we are today. So it's a laudable goal, but we all got to be willing to do the tough lifting to make sure that we can reach that goal. Um, let me ask uh, Mr. Kamshaw, am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, does GSA have different standards, parking standards for federal facilities, uh, transit versus non-transit? We do not today. However, the executive order uh, has asked us to work with other federal agencies to develop different policies than exist today that are around transit-oriented development and siting of uh, federal locations. The initial recommendations of the working groups have now been uh, made public, and the next step is to make them actual. So today our parking policies are fairly uniform without regard to the existence of transportation. However, our procurements take the uh, location uh, uh, next to leases and uh, new buildings requiring where they exist that we locate those facilities near a public transit and uh, whether it's bus or subway or the like. Um, if the chair does not object, I would ask uh, that the subcommittee formally request the GSA um, respond back to us within uh, uh, the next month uh, on what steps it is taking formally to change that policy because it makes no sense whatsoever to have one uniform standard of parking when you may have a building in the middle of a you know, wheat field in Kansas versus a building in a very congested urban area next to a transit station. Furthermore, frankly, it pits the federal government, not intentionally, against the intentions of the localities. My locality, for example, we've worked, moved heaven and earth to get rail to Dulles. We want to re redevelop the Dulles corridor as a transit-oriented development corridor. That means we want to change parking requirements on normal uh, office buildings so that we're encouraging people to get out of the single occupancy vehicles and to use alternative methods of transportation, transit to wit. We need the federal government as a partner if it has facilities in that quarter, not as somebody that stands alone and has its own uniform policies, irrespective of those changes. So um, if, it, if it helps a little bit as a, as a, a prod, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I would make that request and urge you to, on our behalf, make that request. Without well, objection, that will be the order. I thank the chairwoman so much. Thank you. Um, what about trans, uh, transportation demand, uh, demand management plans, TDMs? 
does the GSA uh, have such programs for its federal facilities? And again, does it differentiate between congested urban and suburban and other? Our experience with those is principally in the Washington, D.C. area where we have used them. Uh, for example, we did a rather extensive um, transit study at the uh, commencement of the uh, development of the White Oak campus in um, suburban Maryland uh, to make sure that uh, we did not uh, overburden the existing road system. We have uh, provided uh, a lot of, in, in, in that context, we've provided encouragement to uh, people uh, through transit subsidies. Uh, for example, uh, GSA today provides transit subsidies for nearly half of its employees around the country, a lot of those in Washington, D.C. There are a number of programs that are very community specific to aid not just GSA employees but all federal employees in uh, finding and using ride sharing and other uh, methods of reducing the transportation impact of the facilities. Um, and uh, the executive order also directs us to go further than we have in the past in ensuring that in all of our planning that we not only consult with but plan together with local planning entities. So the, the states and the counties and the localities with planning uh, goals and zoning uh, 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 rules and so on are, are re-emphasized in this executive order that it is uh, an important part of what we should be doing um, as good citizens of the neighborhoods within which we live. You know, uh, our colleague from San Diego began by saying he was cynical about the gap between goals and reality, and, and one can understand. <clears throat> but I guess I, I see the glass as half full, not half empty. I think you have, I think the federal government has an incredible opportunity here to actually go from being what it is today or has been in the past, to actually being the cutting edge model. And let me just say, nothing could be more exciting to me than to actually see us, the federal government, leading the way in green certification, in pre-development hydrology standards, in saving $6 billion a year in energy costs. If we're committed to the goal of energy independence, we've got to take the lead. So I applaud what you're doing, and I hope you'll be seized with this mission, because here's an opportunity, really, for us to strike a blow for energy independence and for the environment at the same time. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, thank this panel for your information provided to us.